Um, I'm Ken Myers. Uh, I'm from Canada, which is, I still think I talk normally, but people here disagree. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to echo a lot of the things Katie's just um, sort of said. I feel like I also don't have a typical pattern. And I feel like if you talk to enough clinician scientists, it becomes more and more clear that there isn't really a typical pattern. Um, so I guess in brief, my background, I, um, I did an undergraduate degree in Canada. In, in Canada, you can't really, most of Canada, you can't go straight into medical school, so that wasn't really an option. Um, and I did a degree called Physics and Physiology that no longer exists. Um, I was the only person to graduate from it. Um, <laughs> and they shut it down. Um, and um, and that, but during that, I did my first um, first research project, which was applying sort of basic physics to model human joint mechanics. And I was thinking about it for some reason sitting here, and it was a terrible research project in retrospect. It was not well executed, and um, but it but it got me started. Um, and following that, I moved to a different city in Canada and started a PhD. Um, still sort of using my physics. It was a PhD in biomedical engineering and I was designing bioreactors and squishing bone cells and, um, and you know, research that doesn't apply at all to the neurology research I do now. Um, but a really valuable time for me because that was when I sort of started to build my writing skills and my critical evaluation of research skills. So I would absolutely go back and do things the same way I did them. Um, while I was doing that, this was in a hospital, and some of my coworkers were applying to medical school, so um, I decided to, to give that a shot and got in. Um, and then in medical school, I just sort of tried everything. And um, eventually, I ended up doing an elective in pediatric neurology and um, decided that was really the thing for me. And um, so I ended up doing a residency in pediatric neurology, which is how it works in Canada. and then. As that was coming to an end, um, you know, your options are sort of, you can go into a purely clinical practice and you can start making money pretty much right away, or, um, or you can look at an academic path. And, um, and then, at least in Canada, that, that sort of requires further training. Um, and I sort of looked around and epilepsy genetics was what I was really interested in. And um, hopefully you know by now, Ingrid is a, either one of or the global leader in, um, in epilepsy genetics. And so even though it was quite scary to, um, to move across the world, um, I came down here after doing a Skype interview with her and she and her colleague Sam Berkovic seemed lovely. So, um, so I came down here and I'm here for a couple of years and um, there's been, you know, some adjustment, but um, it's, uh, it's going really well and I'm really happy I came and, um, and you know, I think it's going to set me up well to, for my plan, which is to work as a pediatric neurologist doing uh, research in epilepsy genetics. So. Thanks, Ken. Kylie? Thanks. So I'm Kylie Mason. I've, I've possibly got, I'm not sure what you would call typical, but maybe a more typical um, pathway to a research career. So I'm Melbourne born and bred and, and did my uh, medical studies at the University of Melbourne. And uh, my first foray into research was in fourth year. We had a compulsory project, which I had a, a number to choose from. And uh, I did paediatric urology, studying undescended testes and uh, dissected maybe 50 rats, gubernaculums. Um, it was just stunning. Um, but it was actually quite interesting and I really enjoyed the hands-on um, aspect of it and the element of, of uh, you know, the, the non, some of the non-clinical aspects to it as well. So I'd always had a thought that I'd be interested in research and I, at various stages through my <coughs> MBBS, toyed with the idea of doing a BMED side, but it wasn't compulsory and, in fact, it was an alternative and it meant taking a year off from my MBBS at the time. And I, I think I just didn't have the guts to really make that leap at the time, um, which I don't necessarily regret. Um, I then went on to do my uh, internship, residency, and, um, and regist physician's exam, and then registrar years, and have trained as a clinical and um, pathological haematologist. So I've got done my physician's and my pathology um, exams and qualifications. So that's an eight-year post-residency 
pathway, so quite a long pathway. And haematology is, I guess, um, possibly resided, regarded as a fairly academic specialty, and there is an expectation that if you're going to work in a public hospital practice in any of the major hospitals, that you will have a higher degree. In fact, it's uh, compulsory. They will not employ you, basically, without a higher degree. And so I was left um, at the age of uh, 32, I think I was, or 33, um, finishing my last year of my registrar years with a couple of clinical papers to my name, largely a couple of case reports and one uh, sort of a small clinical trial that, that my bosses had roped me into. With a feeling that I'd like to do research, I teed up a job in Cambridge um, with the guys who had done a lot of the uh, really critical work in um, myeloproliferative disorders, the genomic work there. And then my uh, then boyfriend, now husband, proposed. And I had a, a real quandary. He's, he's non-medical, his work was in Australia, and he put it to me that he could not travel overseas, that he would accept me. He would, he would, we worked out we probably could spend a year apart, but the more I negotiated with Cambridge, the more it became clear that they wanted me to do one clinical year and then they'd consider me for a two to three year MD and I wanted to come back with a higher degree. I, I didn't want to go overseas without coming back with a bit of paper, essentially. And I was faced with this enormous, enormous quandary, you know, get married, stay in Melbourne or go overseas and risk potentially my relationship, um, as, my, as my husband said, and, and his job was one that he just accepted a promotion. It wasn't negotiable, you know, didn't have that option particularly. Very difficult decision and I decided to stay. And at the time, I felt like I was giving up, um, you know, my hopes and dreams a little bit. But then a door opened and um, I stayed in Melbourne and I managed to secure a PhD position at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute in Melbourne. And in retrospect, why would I travel overseas when essentially the best haematology research in some ways was being done in Australia. And I think, uh, so I have never gone overseas. I've, I've bucked the trend in that respect. Um, that has been put up to me a couple of times as being a failing, um, but it's made it, uh, made me be able to have a career path that suited me personally. So I did a PhD in um, apoptosis. It was a bench PhD. I did no clinical work through those three years and worked purely in the laboratory at the, at the bench. And my basic haematology laboratory training helped with some of just the physical skills of pipetting and, and uh, the quality assurance and the understanding about, about the meticulous um, techniques needed in the laboratory. Um, and went on uh, to have, fortunately, a very successful PhD and early postdoc years publishing in a number of seminal journals and uh, being able to travel um, and, and speak about my work quite widely. And so that was, it's been quite rewarding. I then had three significant career interruptions in five years, um, two with pregnancies and one with a major illness. And that derailed my career quite significantly. <coughs> and I've been spending quite a bit of time um, getting back on track I now work 0.5 as a clinical haematologist, mainly in malignant haematology and in bone marrow transplantation. Um, I have 0.5 appointment at the University of Melbourne in basic research supported by an NH and MRC early career fellowship. And I also do private practice. Um, so technically I'm employed um, 1.1 or something. Um, plus I'm a full-time mum to my two gorgeous kids. So um, I think, you know, the, I, I love my research career. I'm trying to merge more from being, whilst I have, I have a couple of students, I think my biggest struggles are financial and that struggle to support myself, but also support my students. And the stress about being able to be competitive as a part-time researcher is a big issue for me. Um, and uh, also the competition between the clinical work, which is extremely demanding. Um, maybe, you know, particularly in haematology, I find um, and very hard to, to, to block off um, versus the laboratory and being able to maintain both and maintain collaborative partnerships in that role. So. Thanks, Carly. Peter? My name's Peter von Weingarten. Um, I look like I'm 18, but I'm actually 40. Um, <laughs> I'm still asked for my ID when I go for a beer and they sort of pounce on me. We finally got one. <laughs> I always uh, re rejoice in saying that I'm more than twice the age limit. 
Um, <laughs> uh, I, I'm an ophthalmologist. I did my medical degree at Monash um, and, and was very clinically focused, actually. We, um, we had a session, a, a mini sort of version of this, when I was um, just before the final exams, and I uh, shirked that uh, session thinking, no, the, the research game's not for me and I'd rather just go and focus on studying for the, the final exams. Um, and never would have guessed that I would end up here. Um, so I, I did my um, intern year and my residency heading towards physician training, but um, was really reflecting during my resident year that, that I would sort of wanted more. It wasn't really where I saw my career ending up. And, and so I took a very sort of practical approach to career planning and sat down with my dad who was in commerce and, and drew a matrix of, you know, ideal career um, attributes versus all the specialties I could think of um, and sort of... Uh, pragmatically identified about three or four specialties that might fit the bill that I hadn't explored yet, and uh, ophthalmology was one of them, um, having not had much exposure in med school. So I then went about um, sitting in with a couple of ophthalmologists in their private practices and thought, hey, this is quite interesting, mix of surgery and medicine. And, and so I was sort of thinking about ophthalmology, but I wasn't ready to make the commitment. Um, and one of my mentors at the time said, look, um, why don't you try some research with an ophthalmic focus? And I thought that was a good idea and had planned to do a, a master's year. And um, further discussions really had him saying, look, a master's is good, but it doesn't have any currency uh, beyond that year. You really want to, if you're going to do research, do something substantive that will stand you in good stead for your subsequent career. And, and uh, I took that on board and thought, well, I'm going to do perhaps a PhD uh, with a, perhaps a broad focus. So I, I ended up doing a PhD in angiogenesis or new blood vessel formation, which happens to be really important for, for many eye diseases, um, but in a uh, laboratory that, that was closely aligned with the clinical service, and that was at, at Flinders University. Um, so there was the first major decision that had an impact on, on my marital life because I'd um, been in a relationship with my now wife for the entirety of medical school and, and she was um, two years behind me. So she stayed behind in Melbourne while, while I packed off to Adelaide. And that was gonna be a year apart and, and she, you know, she had to do her intern year and she was gonna come across. Uh, but life happens and, and her mum ended up getting leukemia. So we spent three years apart and I think the only way that I survived my PhD was the fact that I had a really, really supportive supervisor um, who was ready to come in on weekends and do the the, the animal work that I would otherwise have to do to allow me to, to go and visit at short notice, visit my, my now wife and her mum. Um, so I got through my PhD and, and really enjoyed it, enjoyed ophthalmology, loved the, the um, challenge of exploring uh, novel questions and the initial direction of my PhD ended up um, vastly removed from where I ended up and, and that was largely because I made a chance discovery that was of interest and, and was given the freedom to pursue that. Um, so having, having finished my PhD, I then started the um, clinical training in ophthalmology um, back here in, in Victoria, uh, finished that five year training program and um, applied for a, an NHNMRC postgraduate fellowship only to find that I was uh, a couple of months beyond the, the four year window of um, post PhD that, that was uh, required for eligibility, but uh, being rather tenacious, I dug my heels in and, and made an appeal on the grounds of, um, um, you know, justice and, and uh, you know, because I'd, I'd had a, um, there, there was a caveat within the, the, um, the, the constitution that I, that I could appeal and, um, you know, I was awarded a, an NHMRC PhD scholarship and so I said, look, um, if you're giving PhD scholarships to pre-specialist trainees, um, it's, it's very short-sighted then to not have a funding scheme for those um, that, that follow the course, do the specialty training in the shortest possible space of time and then be rendered ineligible. So I challenged that and that was actually granted, um, my, my fellowship was granted. So I went off to Cambridge and um, was originally going to do stem cell research in, in retina and uh, my uh, original supervisor had changed tack and aligned himself with Pfizer and was spending most of his time in, in, this, in the States. Uh, and so I changed and ended up in a laboratory doing research in uh, regenerative biology and MS. So a big departure from ophthalmology, but my take on that was 
um, exposure to high quality neuroscience, you know, at the highest levels would inevitably uh, bear fruit that I could bring back to ophthalmology and, and that's what I'm doing at the moment in a very um, supportive research environment with great mentors, um, you know, and, and now having the chance to sort of spread my wings. Um, the decision to go overseas uh, was also predicated on, on timing. My wife had, had qualified just as a radiologist and we decided to start a family. So um, we raised um, two children uh, in Cambridge, which was a, a challenge. So I guess some of those issues around timing of families apply perhaps a, a lot to males as, as they do to females. I mean, I'm, I'm a very involved dad, so uh, research has given me a bit of freedom to get involved in, in some of the parenting. Um, but I think I'll hand over at that point. Thanks, Peter. Um, hi, I think I know lots of people in the audience and Monash students, it's lovely to be here. I'm not like these career clinician scientist academy people. Um, I'm the deputy dean at Monash running the medical course and I'm the deputy director of rheumatology at Monash Health. I think I'm the deputy of everything. I'm, I'm going to be a deputy for the rest of my life. I really like it. Uh, so um, I'm also the... Well, I'm not the deputy there. I'm the, I'm the ch chief examiner for the College of Physicians and chair of the national exam panel for that college and about to set off on that exam cycle now, uh, examining 800 basic physician trainees who want to enter specialty training. So it's about to be a very busy time for me. I'm also a parent, um, but a reason I'm... Just sort of, I guess I'm different to these guys in some ways, but, but not in others. I, I was a clinician scientist, and I think I still am. I think once a clinician scientist, always a clinician scientist. So I did my training um, in rheumatology and uh, internal medicine, and I undertook a PhD in the lab in cytokine biology, glucocorticoid action, and I uh, did about 10 years of postdoctoral research. Um, and had some NH and MRC grants and even was an investigator on one NIH grant. And then um, these big uh, e educational opportunities came my way and, and people said, would you like to do this job or that job? Um, and, you know, one of the things I think is that I think of myself as a clinician, scientist, educator, parent, and I think I'm sort of connecting a little with uh, all the stories here today. I, I find it very difficult to be all four of those things at once. And so I have decided that I'm always going to be a clinician and I'm always going to be a parent, uh, but that I have intensely engaged with um, things in a sequential way. So I spent a period of time being intensely interested in basic science research, and now I'm intensely interested in education and you guys. But I still supervise PhD students and really do love it. And the thing I'd say to you is, even if you're not a clinician scientist for life, um, cl being a clinician scientist opens many, many doors. For example, the dean, Christina Mitchell, who's an incredible scientist, uh, a clinician scientist herself, said, I'm not having anyone running the medical course who doesn't have a PhD and isn't a clinician scientist. Um, lots of the opportunities that have come my way in education have strangely come my way because I've done a PhD and because of the things I've done, and it informs absolutely everything I do. Even if I'm not in the lab right now getting my hands dirty, it's changed the way I practice medicine, it's changed the way I conduct ward rounds and I think about things, it's changed the way I supervise people, it's changed the way I educate. So it's been such an enriching thing to do. Um, I still love and am involved with my lab that I came from, which uh, we focus on glucocorticoids. As a rheumatologist, I see the harm that we do to patients with steroids. And as a scientist, I love to think about the molecules that are induced by glucocorticoids and what we can learn from that. And I can see some of our BMED Sci students and others in the audience who've been involved in that research. So you stay really energised uh, and you stay connected to the things that are important to patients. So I, I cannot recommend it highly enough uh, to you incredibly bright people that being a clinician scientist, even if it's only for 10 years, is a really worthwhile thing to do. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle. Great. So at this point, I think we might open it up to questions. Um, so we've got a couple of roving mics, if anyone's got some questions. Hi, thank you for everyone's introductions. I really love the theme in this session about um, you know, breaking all the rules and challenging conventional wisdom, and you've all taken really interesting routes. Um, I, was one, I had two questions related to that. First of all, I can imagine breaking from conventional wisdom can stir up a lot of feelings of insecurity, and I wonder if 
members of the panel feel insecure sometimes and how do they cope with that? And secondly, what sort of strategies and, and things do you do? Um, or what attitudes, I suppose, um, keep your options open so that you do have the freedom to chop and change from different um, specialties down the track and find something that you're really passionate about? Peter, you look like you're ready to answer that question. Yeah, it's, it's a very astute question. Um, my experience was very much, you know, I got, I got to the end of my residency and I felt like I had some degree of mastery over, over clinical work, you know. At least I, I knew my way around the ward. Um, and then you go into, PhD, into the PhD and mine was a, a fundamental um, science PhD working with rats and didn't know the right end of a pipette <laughs> from the back end. So, you know, you sort of go back back down to the bottom of the, you know, the ladder. Um, and during your PhD, you gradually climb your way up again until you're sort of an expert in your domain. And then you hop back off that ladder onto, back onto the clinical ladder um, and, you know, into a new specialty. Um, so for me, it was very much a, a cyclical thing. And I think um, that's a challenge as much as an opportunity. I think um, those sorts of experiences um, lead to humility. Um, they lead to resilience, and I think that those are uh, a key attributes that you need for a successful career um, as a clinician scientist, but I think for success in life in general. So I think viewing it as a, as a long-term journey and seeing those as, as natural challenges and that you're not alone in these challenges, um, that these are experiences that we all face. Um, and, you know, life's going to get pretty boring if, if it's just one ladder that you're climbing. Uh, I never just want to, you know, be on one ladder and looking looking down from a lofty view down at the mere mortals a few rungs down. You know, that's that's not the way we, we want to live our lives, I don't think. My husband's a psychiatrist and um, during my PhD he said I was... He was fairly certain I was clinically depressed um, for the first year. And I think what actually happened was I think I went into this thing thinking I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a medical graduate and, I, you know, I can have mastery over anything, you know, and I think I thought well, I'll be curing rheumatoid arthritis, you know, within the year. Um, and it rapidly became apparent that it was going to take me a whole year just to generate one graph. Uh, <laughs> and that, um, you know, that, that actually I sucked at pipetting and centrifuging and all those other things. And I was an absolute danger in the lab. And thank goodness for these beautiful scientists who looked after me. And I will never, never forget their kindness to this day. Um, but, you know, you, it's, it's a progressive humiliation is what actually <laughs> happens when you do research. And when you're around researchers and great people, there are always so many people greater than yourself and you're just constantly inspired by those people. And also, too, I mean, I love the Monash motto, you know, Ancora Imparo, because it's the kind of imagination you have to think what we don't yet know, what needs to be discovered. That is a kind of humility, you know, I don't know. So I think the thing about doing a PhD is it just, all it taught me was all the things I don't know. Mm. Um, but I also got this beautiful, like, little mastery over this little niche area that I could kind of talk about. Yeah, I think, you know, talking about building resilience, I mean, I, you know, I think if you had to count the, the, the number of times you felt sort of squashed down or beaten down versus the number of times you had a win, it feels like sometimes that the the lows are, are more than the highs, but the highs are often so high that they, are, you know, they balance. But I think one of the unique things as a clinician scientist is you've got that balance and perspective. And for me, often when things aren't going well in one area, I only have to turn to another part of my mm. my multifaceted life to find many highs. Mm. Um, and that helps you know keep me grounded, keep some perspective. Something that we very much as clinicians bring to the table is that clinical perspective and. You know, you can be in a meeting where everything's just way over your head and then all of a sudden you just go, yeah, but that won't work because, you know, you just know something about the clinical conundrum. Mm -hmm. Even if it's a sense that, you know, somebody's developing a drug that needs to be given, you know, intravenously for six months or something, you just go, this, you know, you just bring that clinical perspective to the table and so you feel rewarded by and valued from that perspective. I think the other thing is, you know, be open to opportunities um, that come along. So um, I've been invited and I'm a member of the PBAC committee. Um, so something completely different. But what that's done is not only given me a, a forum where I'm an equal amongst some very um, experienced and senior people in Australia, 
um, you know, and complete, but completely different. But it's also given me a whole completely different group of potential collaborators. But um, the economics and the epidemiology that I've been exposed to through having to discuss and review multiple um, drug company submissions to get drugs funded in Australia, which is very dry on one level, but the, the knowledge, the wealth knowledge and, and the experience, and again, you, you know, sitting next to a econo health economist and being able to say, hey, what does that mean? What that brings then to my research when I'm writing a grant and I have to be able to put that in some perspective. So just opening, you know, opening your mind and um, the door to any opportunities that come your way because you never know how that's going to benefit. It all interrelates. It benefits not only my clinical career but also my um, my research career equally and, and you get that balance right right across. Any questions? Any more questions? Thank you so much for sharing your stories and being honest. I just want to ask, you made us all very enthused about becoming a cl clinician scientist and you emphasised how important mentors are and supportive supervisors are. I'm just wondering, uh, obviously we're all looking for this really magical su like supportive supervisor, but what qualities and attributes in us can we practise and finesse that make us attractive to mentors that we want to be our mentor. The last two, the sort of how to write a paper, how to give a talk presentations, I thought were both excellent. And that research communication is so important. And those are skills you can work on throughout medical school at, and just at every stage. Um, you know, since undergrad, I always have had at least three different writing, you know, projects that I'm working on. And, and I'm often working on them by myself and I just go back to them every night and try to make them a little better. And, um, and, that, and that sort of writing skill is something you can develop on your own. Um, and um, it's the same with presentation. You know, you're gonna be giving presentations through medical school at case rounds or things like that. And you can do the bare minimum there or you can sort of take the you know what, what came out in, in the talk just now and apply that and then afterwards you know talk to people and say I honestly actually want to know what you think like how could I make this better um, because those communication skills are so important um, and just as a, maybe as a side note um, interesting things can come out of them I had a um, paper that I worked on in medical school again it was just sort of a writing um, project I made for myself because I thought it was fun. Um, I, I wrote a, I can see some eye rolls back there. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm not, I'm not cool. Um, it was, I thought it'd be funny to write a paper making the argument that smoking was a good, an underused tool in endurance performance training. Um, and that's sort of making this weird argument that you could make it. Um, and I wrote the paper and then after, um, you know, after I kind of worked on it for a while, I was like, this is actually kind of interesting. I think people might, because it makes a point about research um, and review papers and my girlfriend at the time, I remember quite clearly um, telling me nobody wants to hear about your BS, except she didn't say BS. Um, <laughs> and, and this goes a bit to people will tell you that, you know, you, you know, people will, will tell you that what you're doing is dumb. Um, anyway, that paper ended up being published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, um, which has an impact factor of like seven or something. Um, and it's actually been cited a few times since then. Um, some people don't understand that it's not a serious paper, but, um, <laughs> the, yeah. And, but, I, but I've had like people legitimately say, you know, I really enjoyed that paper. Um, it, it makes some good points. Um, so just having the point is just having these projects and working on them can actually be productive, even if it doesn't seem like it's a project that's ever going to get published or be useful. So. To carry on with that point, I think um, you know nothing makes uh, a potential uh, student more appealing than money. So if you if you um, put yourself in a position that you are fundable then you are very appealing. So if you show the initiative during your medical training to write some case reports or show some interest in, in research, do something to 
to lift you up the tier in, in terms of fundability, that's always uh, appealing because if you can get an NH and MRC PhD scholarship, then that's uh, immediately something appealing for a potential supervisor. That's not to say that you'll have to have that before you, you meet a potential supervisor, but it is something that, that would be appealing. I mean, I just want to say, actually, you're all appealing, uh, very. <laughs> and uh, this is just something I didn't realise. When I started my PhD, I went home and said to my mum, I've been chosen, you know, I've been chosen to do a PhD. I, I thought, you know, God, amazing, right? Little did I know, like, they they just were, couldn't wait, like, to get their hands on this, you know, like, medical graduate who's done some, you know, advanced training to do a PhD. I mean, you guys are all in demand. Um, what I notice as someone who educates medical students is you're all also utterly brilliant. And it's very hard to tell the difference between one and another of you um, because you all have these achievements that I cannot believe. Um, and I was talking to our MUMIS president about this or one of our students the other day that... Um, the email, uh, you know, signatures of my medical students, including Eddie, absolutely terrify me. You know, managing director of all kinds of things, you know, and just in medical school. But at the end of the day, it's like what Ewan said in his talk. The people that really stand out are the people who present themselves in a particular way because you're all smart. So sometimes I see a student giving a talk and I think, I want that student as a BMED Sci student or I want that, you know, we want that student as a PhD student because people who can communicate their research is where the power really is going to lie. So it's a special skill if you can do that. I, I did my PhD after my registrar years, but I'm a um, supervisor in the physician program of both basic and advanced trainees and quite a, have quite a, um, a experience of, of mentoring uh, young people and a number of young people who've departed uh, for various reasons, uh, some to have children, some uh, just because they were, were one because facing almost burnout and just needed a year off, uh, one one or two because they've just wanted to travel. Um, and, and I mean, depending on the departure, I think a lot of, of where you're coming back to depends on a bit of the planning before you go. Um, and you know, if, if you know you're going to have a, a one year or a three year or whatever planning, building those bridges before you leave. So, um, in, you know, making sure that people know who you are, keeping in contact with those people while you're away. Um, so a lot of the people from, you know, our department that have been keen have left, say, after their residency for a few years and then come back, um, have just kept in contact with our department, you know, every so often an email dropped in when they're in Melbourne, you know, uh, you know, if they were. Some have done a little bit of volunteer work in between, has helped out, um, just so that people don't forget who they are. Certainly, if you're going away to do research, you'll come back as a more valued person. Um, and it's not to say that if you've gone away to be a mother or to have a travel, you know, travel or anything, you won't be. But, but having that bit of paper that has a higher degree on it certainly makes you, uh, as far as, you know, all the rankings when we're selecting registrars or residents and we're doing the matching, um, that, that is a tick box. Um, whereas, unfortunately, motherhood and life experience don't get you a tick box on a on a, uh, a, a matching service, for example, which is how most of our residents and residents, uh, registrars are, are chosen. But it really is, I think, um, as most of us know, sometimes it's not exactly what you've done or who you are, it's who you know um, in medicine. And, and as much as it often uh, is meant to come down to the, uh, you know, it's all meant to come down to rankings and things like that, often it is who you know and, um, and those personal connections, I think. I would also say that if you're tackling, say, a fundamental um, PhD, so spending your time in the lab, trying to keep your hand in clinically to some extent um, can ease that transition back. So when I was uh, in the lab doing my PhD, I was doing um, a fairly much a hell-raising um, session a week uh, on call in ophthalmology uh, with my very um, poorly defined ophthalmic skills at that stage. Um, so it was quite stressful, but it was really um, made my transition back into the clinic a lot easier. So it was, it was a source of stress and, and, and some difficulty at the time, but it was definitely worth it. So that'd be my strong recommendation. Um, yeah, I took some time off after second year residency and travelled for a year, um, but did include some not a small experience in medicine at uh, another hospital as part of it, but was really mainly just having a good time and uh, travelling. That was the idea. Um, but I think, you know, I mean, before I left, I 
worked very hard and um, I don't know, I think there's a lot to be said for being, you know, just available, affable and able, you know, those things. People remember you, like they think, oh, you're hard working, I want you back, where have you been, there's that. I think keeping in touch, those things are really helpful too. Um, but I also think, you know, making your intentions clear, you know, so here, here's what I, here's where I see myself, here's where I'm going, I'm taking a break right now, this is what I'm doing. But when I come back, this is what I'm going to do. This is my intention. And your intention may change. That's fine. Then you won't, you won't care because you'll be headed off in another direction. But I think, you know, making your intentions at that time very clear. Um, I think a lot of people are taking time off and I really don't think the order in which you do things does matter. Um, I think it's just character is destiny to some extent. And, you know, if you're really passionate about something and you're good at it and you, you put your back into something... And people sort of won't forget you. Hi, so I'm a bit of a black sheep in the room because I'm actually a Master of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Amsterdam. Um, but as an astronomer, we're expected and it's highly advantageous to study overseas. And I'm curious if that's the same in medical research and what the pros and cons are to going overseas and getting some, a Master's or a PhD overseas or doing it all locally. So, um, yeah, I guess in medicine, um, sorry, this probably won't be as a applicable to your field, or, or it might be. Um, the way it sort of works, I trained in a place called Calgary, and when you're a resident, there are attending physicians or consultant physicians, and you sort of report to them, and you do what they tell you to do, and there's this hierarchy that they get very used to that you're the one that they tell to do things and you do them and they're here and you're here. Um, and even once you reach the end of your training, if you get hired on there, that perception often sort of remains. It's not like you'd get mistreated, but you don't, when people talk about which doctor saw the patient, there's still this perception that they're just out of training. If you go away and come back, um, there's, you know, you're now the, like when I, I'm hoping to go back to Calgary, when I go back, I'll be that guy who worked with Ingrid Sheffer and Sam Berkovic in Melbourne, this exotic place. Um, <laughs> and, um, and the things I say will have, for better, for right or wrong, more weight. Um, because of the training I've had at a different center. Um, so there's that perception. There's also a huge advantage in that clinical medicine is done very differently in different parts of the world. And I've, that's, that's the real benefit of me coming here, is that I see how Ingrid does things and it's different than, than how neurologists did them in Calgary and other places in Canada that I trained. Um, and that exposure is really valuable from a clinical perspective because, again, I think the people who have trained medicine here, you get taught things and you just sort of accept them, even though there's often not a paper that supports them. Um, that's, that's just what you do in medicine. Um, and going to another place where they don't do that um, is, uh, it can just broaden your mind as to, to, to you know, how medicine can be practiced. Um, I think speaking from the perspective of someone who hasn't gone overseas, um, there's probably been two main career junctions where I've had a lot of pressure to go overseas. Um, first to do my research and then the second one was following my research to do a postdoctoral career. And I had been told um, on more than one occasion and I particularly remember being told by someone who was um, a member of the academy and very well respected in Australia and in, in my field uh, that my career was basically over if I didn't go overseas. And I've heard that on more than one occasion. And certainly uh, I get asked why I haven't gone overseas. And I mean, I, I've shared my story of why I didn't. It was a personal reason, but I, I don't think it should be a, a career junction. I think, um, I, th I do think Ken's point about going away from your clinical career and coming back is quite important, particularly in a small, small place like Melbourne. Melbourne is relatively small, certainly haematology or any the particular specialty is relatively small. You know everybody in the specialty. It's, it is important 
even for your own personal growth, to go away and come back. Now, that going away for me was doing a PhD, but it could be going away to do anything, really. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a personal growth as much as anything. And it's also a recognition in the perception of others when you come back, no matter where you've been, that you're older, more mature, wiser, um, have some experience of, 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 of differential, um, you know, experience. And I think, for me, um, that is what makes a big difference. Um, you know, I'm hoping that I can avail myself of opportunities to collaborate. I do collaborate extensively overseas and, you know, to spend some time overseas in the future uh, on sabbatical, et cetera, et cetera, because, you know, I, I do also think, you know, just personally I'd like to do it, um, and, and the opportunity just hasn't been right for me. Um, so, you know, I don't think you have to go overseas. I do think there are distinct advantages, but I think it's how you work it as well and, and how you put that, that slant on it and how you present yourself when you're, you know, when it comes up, when, it, you know, you're either interviewing or... Or whatever, and that question comes up, or some, you know, is how you present yourself and how you um, how you present, you know, that opportunity that you had um, in Australia. And as I said before, why why for me, I don't think I would have got a better PhD or better papers or a better postdoctoral experience anywhere in the world. Uh, Australia was the place to do it. So why, you know, why go? You know, in some ways. Yeah, and I think Ronaldo said it really well. You know, it's about the journey. It's about having fun and. Um, you know, we, we had such tremendous fun spending two years in Cambridge, seeing another part of the world, which, you know, is a unique place. You know, I think I heard six Nobel laureates speak. Um, I saw in my, my um, postdoc supervisor someone who was just tremendous at establishing co collaborations. You know, there's a hot finding in the lab. He'll be straight on the phone to Harvard and, you know, things will be happening around the world. And, you know, to get, to get exposed to that energy, that, that melting pot of of um, research um, intelligence and dynamism um, is just a great opportunity. And there's only um, certain phases of your life that you can do that more easily. I think once, you know, as a clinician, you've got a, a private practice, if you're heading that way or you're really established, it gets harder and harder. So um, do yourself a favour. It's fun. I think I, I did my postdoc in inverted commas in Melbourne and I wish I had gone away. And I think part of the reason is I've been at Monash Health and Monash University all my life, and I don't think at this stage it's likely I'm ever going to leave. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, one of the problems I have is that it's, it's uh, you know, I still walk down the corridors of Monash Health and consultants who, um, you know, trained me years ago say, by the way, Michelle, we just check that blood test for me. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, that I say, oh, but I, I, I'm a consultant now, you know. I'm a deputy dean. Like, all right, then I'll go and check the blood test for you. Uh, no, actually, I can say check it yourself. But one of, the things about, uh, one of the things about that is that going away and coming back, you can reinvent yourself and you can uh, transcend some earlier version of yourself and sometimes it's easier to do that by leaving and coming back. 